Okay, uh, so let's get started. So this is lecture 20 of ECE 503. So in today's lecture, as promised in lecture 19, we're going to talk about IIR systems and structures and, um, you know, a few ways of representing them. So we talked about DF1 and DF2. We talked a little bit about it in lecture 19 as a motivation for FIR realizations. Here we're going to talk about DF1 and DF2 in detail. And we'll also talk a little bit about techniques for understanding, realizing them, and, uh, and, and go into a little bit into lattice ladder structures, which implement um, the IR filters. So we saw that lattices um, implement FIR, but a lattice ladder also implements the IR realization. Because what was missing, what was missing in the lattice that is required in an IR is feedback, right? So in a lattice structure, all we had is forward, 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 forward with delay elements. Lattice ladder, on the other hand, is we have to have something that closes the loop, where we feed information back into the structure. All right. So everyone should be somewhat familiar, again, with the DF1, the direct form 1 and direct form 2 realizations, which we have uh, here. And um, just like what I dis discussed before, uh, this structure here is really the, you know, the all zero system, the H1 of Z. And what's interesting is that that, that by itself, if we just take that and we exclude this portion here, we get our FIR filter, right? If we put it on its side, we got our tap delay line. Now, when we combine it with this guy here, the feedback structure, the all pole system, now what we've got is we've concatenated all pole and all zero to form our DF1 IR system. And then if we do a little bit of magic, you know, just like Charlie Brown, what ends up happening is we can do a switcheroo between all pole and all zero systems in terms of their order to get the DF2. What do we have? We have savings. What happens is we use a lot fewer delay elements, right? And we just have like this one path that feeds both forward and backward to form our IR structure. Now, there is something called a signal flow graph, which is sort of a quick way of realizing what, like, you know, an IR system. So instead of, you know, like, did you notice, like, for instance, like, it, like when I'm up here, you know, with all your eyes looking at me, no, just kidding. What happens is, have you noticed, it's a little bit frustrating when I have to, like, okay, 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 everyone, do you see what I'm drawing here? Um, all right, now I'm going to pass it through this delay element. This takes a few seconds to draw. Okay, and then I have another delay element. Okay, and then, oh yeah, now I have this like multipl multiplication here. And then I have this multiplication there. And then afterwards, oh, I have this little plus sign here. And then so on, and an adder here, and another multiplication. And same thing, multiply, and then add, and then add and then add, right? Time consuming. Just have to spell it out, just for effect. So what we do instead is we use something called a signal flow graph. So this is like my shorthand for something like this. So what happens is we have nodes, and what ends up happening is so we have, let's say, a line. And then we have, let's say, this guy, if I put a z minus 1, z minus 1, right? And then afterwards, it's like we, we just put like a little, first of all, we have a little black dot. Black dot, to me, means it's an additive node. Here's a node. That's a node. Oh. Forgot to do that. And then we can just put a little triangle and multiply by coefficient. Okay. So what happens is instead of having to put 
boxes and circles with pluses and time signs and stuff. All you do is you just have little triangles to reflect either if you're multiplying by a constant or if there's a delay element there. So really it's quick. And everything else is just a mesh. You just draw lines. And, it sh and what ends up happening is also you, you can find out based on the direction of these like little terms here uh, which way the signal is flowing from all of this, right? So signal flow graph is, is a pretty nice shorthand to use in, in situations such as these. So, yeah, so, oh, and, uh, my bad. I also forgot about branch nodes. So branch node, what it does is it basically says, your signal is doing this. It's actually splitting in two. So you also have the branch nodes. You have the adder nodes, which I described. You can indicate the, either the gains or the delay elements in all, in all of this. You can also numerically mark off. This is actually quite nice. You can, mark, you can indicate the number. Like you can associate that branch node or that adder node with a label. Like, oh, that's node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. And what happens is this is for easy identification later on. It's like, oh, OK, I'm interested in this node and what's happening over here. What's kind of interesting also is that if you reverse the direction of this entire structure, right, what ends up happening? If you reverse the direction of all the branches and you switch between branching nodes and adder nodes, you should get basically, you should get the basic same I.O. relationship from all of this, right? And when that happens, it's called transposition. All right. So just as before, and this is actually kind of a little bit more important. I think this, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this um, structure is in your problem set, the cascade form structure. Parallel form is also there as well. But let's, let's look at... Um, at uh, a cascade structure. So a cascade structure, or a cascade form structure, looks exactly like what we saw for FIR, but all second order structure, uh, they're all second order segments. So what I'm doing, essentially, is I'm taking the numerator and I'm breaking it up into quadratic polynomials, right? So zero, there's a z to the 0, z to the minus 1, z to the minus 2, done. Next segment, z to the 0, z to the minus 1, z to the minus 2, done. So I have to factor out that very large polynomial in the numerator into second order polynomials, and mul many of them multiplied together. I do the same with the denominator, and then I take new second order numerator, second order denominator, and create its own subfunction its own second order segment. And then I multiplied with the next second order segment. Numerator and denominator are both second order. And then third and fourth and fifth and so on. So how does that look like? So just like before. Hi. Boop. So what I can do is I can say, OK, h of z is equal to b naught plus b1 z to the minus 1 plus b2 z to the minus 2 plus b3 z to the minus 3 plus b4 z to the minus 4. Tuk, tuk, tuk. And then a0 plus a1 z to the minus 1 plus a2 z to the minus 2 plus a3 z to the minus 3 plus a4 z to the minus 4. Tuk, tuk, tuk. And what I'm instead doing is I'm doing the following. B00 zero zero plus B01 zero z to the minus 1 plus B02 zero b to the minus 2. Done. B0, mm, no, B10 zero plus B11 one one z to the minus 1 plus B12 z to the minus 2. Done. B20, I think you guys are knowing where this is going, right? So, so what ends up happening is I'm just decomposing the numerator and same thing for the denominator into quadratic expressions 
I'm basically factorizing the numerator and denominator into quadratics, and then I take this one step further. So let's say that's a0 zero, zero plus a01. Zero, I'm just choosing, like, you know, the two number subscripts to just to differentiate the coefficients, okay, folks? Okay. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking this guy here and I'm calling him, okay, h1 of z, h2 of z, h3 of z, and so on and so forth. And so now what I've got. is this guy, lots of products. And so this now becomes equivalently looks like this. OK? And so each one of these, how does this look like? Let's do a DF2 realization of this guy this guy, this guy, and what you'll find, discard, what you're going to find is that each one of those hi of z segments looks like, I'm not going to draw a signal flow diagram here. <laughs> Right? So what I get here, and then let's say coefficient, 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 coefficient. So what I get here is now that's my basic unit, and then that is what's being applied in every one of these subsystems. OK? Now, what happens is, What's the other thing that we play with when we have rational system transfer functions? We play with PFE. Oh, don't forget PFE. Partial fraction expansion. And so what partial fraction expansion does is the following. Remember when we played with partial fraction expansion, what we end up getting our h of z. Now what we get is something like this. We get some sort of guy, 1 plus z to the minus 1. Let's say there's a coefficient 0, a1, z to the minus 1, plus, right? And then that's a1, that's a2, that's a3, right? So this is achieved by PFE, which everyone knows and loves, right? How does this look like in terms of realization of the filter? It looks like this. It's a parallel realization. So what happens is now, each one of these guys forms its own system. Right? And then we can sum it up together. So what we have is we can either do cascade form, in which case we do not break up the, um, the rational transfer function, but rather just decompose it into uh, quadratics. Um, and in the parallel realization, we actually do the partial fraction expansion to break it up, literally break it up into the sum of first order, maybe second order expressions, right? And we get that parallel realization at the end of the day. So that, that's a couple of realizations. Ah, and now the last but not least is the lattice ladder. So in lecture 19, we talked about the lattice. We talked about how did we get to the lattice from a tap delay line. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the lattice ladder. And this lattice ladder, what we have to remember is that 
what, what happens is we need to incorporate some sort of feedback structure in order to have the, um, the um, sort of the, the feedback component of an IR system, basically the denominator. And so what happened is, like so in this case, what we've got is initially we had the forward prediction and the backward prediction segments of our lattice from lecture 19. In this lecture, we have a structure that looks a little bit more like this. So we have x of n. And what's kind of interesting is our target is still the output y of n, but notice the structure. Look at the structure. What we've got is this really wonky looking thing where we feed information down one direction, the forward direction indicated here. Let me put in the full screen mode. Okay, just like before, the top branch feeds information forward and gives us our desired output. But, two differences. Look at the bottom. Look at the direction and how the information is flowing at the bottom. Before, with our lattice, both top and bottom branches were going from the input towards the direction of the output, and the lattices were crossing over, and the delay element at the bottom, everything was flushing from left to right. Now, our information, like, you know, our signal is propagating forward on the top branch, but the output is now fed into a delay line with lattice structures feeding backwards, back into the forward path. That is what's accomplishing that is what's accomplishing our IR structure, right? That feedback element. So let, let's, let's look at this a little bit more. So what we've got, right, we have x of n. I'm just going to draw a straight path, straight shot to y of n. Okay, that's desired. But what we're then doing is we're saying, OK, I'm going to take this guy now. I'm going to delay. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking that output, adding it to this guy who's going forward from left to right. But this information is now heading backwards, right? It's the backwards direction. Backward forward. And then likewise, I'm taking this guy and I'm adding him here. Then I repeat z to the minus 1 and do everything all over again. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so I just keep on doing that. Okay. So what ends up happening is data gets delayed. So this here, guess what that is? That's my y n minus 1. And just as before, we have those coefficients k1, k1. And then we just progressively work our way backwards. So now at this element, now we have y n minus 2 plus we have whatever has accumulated on the forward direction feeding back into it. So what we end up getting, what we end up getting essentially is going to be a collection of delayed versions of the output summed with a collection of the x of n's, and the thing is the x of n is also showing up as well, because what ends up happening is this x of n gets fed into this branch, this x of n gets fed into this branch, and everything sort of interchanges. So buried in this, in this branch will be a collection of these x of n's, which will also get delayed at some point, plus delayed versions, and weighed versions of the y of n. So a little bit more complicated, 
right? But in essence, this structure is quite a bit different than our previous lattice structure, right? We'll keep that. So the general expression for this type of lattice is indicated below. So just like what we saw before, like all the, the sort of the uh, previous expressions that I kind of skimmed through in the last lecture because, again, it's very tedious uh, to follow, but they're there more for informational purposes that you can look, out, look at afterwards. But, but physically, the understanding here is that we can represent the IR structure from this. And there is a relationship that exists between the K1s, the K2s, the K3s, all the way to the KNs, and the BNs and the ANs. And so these expressions here, the Fn of n is equal to x of n, right? This guy here, and then all these other f and g functions, they all percolate forward and backwards using this sort of recursive expression, these two expressions. And then how do you, like let's say we take the z transform of these guys. So that's a way of simplifying all of this. Instead of playing with just um, you know, time domain expressions with delayed elements, why not take the z transform, right? Right? So what we do is we take the Z transform of these F's and G's, and what we get is we get the forward system function and the backward system function. And those two guys actually help us create the all pole and all zero system that we can use in like let's say a DF1 or DF2 structure. All right? So then, if we use both poles and zeros, we have now that lattice ladder structure, um, which I won't talk too much about, except that it looks really, really interesting. So you will have that lattice structure, and then you're going to have lines that drop off from it, and then they too are multiplied and delayed into a separate sort of, it's hard to explain, but in the textbook, you'll see it's, it's kind of an interesting structure. So in addition to that phi forward and phi reverse, you also have lines that come off at ever so often, and those have coefficients multiplied with them and then delayed and summed together to create the zero portion of the structure. Right now, we're only looking at uh, poles. All right. So the last element of this, of this lecture, which I didn't bring up, but um, it's good to reiterate. So several lectures ago, we talked about um, numerical representations and fixed point versus floating point operations, right? And what is fixed point? So floating point calculations, what happens is your, dec your decimal place and number, uh, so your decimal point and the number of decimal places sort of vary in terms of the operation when you do it on a floating point processor like your computer, right? So this avoids nasty things like, you know, um, you, you, you rep like let's say you run out of um, decimal places and then you get an incorrect calculation because what happens is whatever calculation you do, it overflows and, and bad things happen. And so fixed point on your hand, if you're going to use fixed point representation, your decimal place will always be in the exact same location for all your calculations throughout the entire operation. And what's interesting to note is that this sort of, this sort of representation is used in things like FPGAs, so field programmable gate arrays, and perhaps other sort of specialized computer architectures, um, as opposed to, let's say, using something like MATLAB and Simulink and stuff where you use floating point all the time. Right? So fixed point, the bad thing about fixed point, OK, so one is that, that nasty thing is if you do a calculation, and then it's like, oh my god, I just needed a few more decimal places, and something bad happens. Like, you know, it's like, um, and, and then the other problem is you get quantization error because if you don't have enough of that representation, if you don't, ha what, what ends up happening is you're effectively quantizing it relative to, let's say, the floating point representation. So let's, let's go back to floating point representation. And so we have the, we, in particular, we have this like mantissa, we have the exponent, and we have the sine bit. So that's what happens when we talk about like a 32-bit floating point representation. 
And that's described by the IEEE 754 standard. And of course, a lot of you should have heard about most significant bit and least significant bit in terms of the amount of change, like let's say the, the lar largest influence on that number. So things like um, 1 times 10 to the 2 is way more significant than let's say 5 times 10 to the minus 2, right? And so what we're really interested in, and we won't see too much of this in class, although I do believe in the problem set that I just posted, you guys will be playing with fixed point representation. Okay, so uh, there will be a little bit of exploration as you look at the quantization, like, you know, sort of like the, how the numbers get a little bit off from their floating, floating point equivalent. So that will be explored in, in your problem set for, for this week. Um, so as an exercise for all of you, please check out uh, section 9.4.3 um, to look a little bit more at this. But we're not going to do any hardware. We're not going to use like actual FPGA or DSP hardware and play with um, fixed point. Oh, that's another class. Okay. Okay. So with that, that is um, lecture 20 of ECE 503. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to make the final push for the